Hi, uh, and uh, welcome to the first installation of Option Pricing Methodology Explained. Um, my name is Max Fonerov. I'm a founding principal of Service Advisors. Uh, our firm provides valuations uh, for, of businesses, intangible assets, and financial instruments for strategic tax and financial reporting purposes. Um, uh, we are located in San Francisco Bay Area, and our firm was founded in 2008. Uh, this is first out of two videos uh, that will um, uh, talk about the uh, theory behind option pricing methodology. So, um, the uh, option pricing methodology is something that is uh, very common these days in the valuation of complex structures for venture-backed companies. Uh, the um, main uh, challenge that uh, valuation uh, practitioners um, encountered um, a few years ago is, and actually a while ago, is to really be able to value individual financial instruments based on the value of the overall enterprise. So as you can see, if we took the, the company and we used the traditional discounted cash flows and market multiples method to come up with the value of the equity, that gives us um, th that step is pretty well understood in the in the finance community. However, the uh, valuation of individual financial instruments that contribute to the capital structure, contribute to the equity value, is uh, a little more tricky and uh, requires uh, less intuitive methodologies. So, option pricing method is something that helps us make that transition. So uh, before we dive in, the, dive in, the high level assumptions that we have to make are the following. Uh, first of all, the equity value, this $26 million, uh, will not depend on the capital structure itself. So um, regardless of how the company was financed, that's really irrelevant to the value of the equity. The value of each class of equity is always positive, it, and it cannot be zero. Uh, there is uh, no future obligation uh, associated with equity securities, uh, not in most, in the predominant number of cases. It's not, and uh, so uh, the values are always positive. Uh, even warrants and stock options, no matter how much out of the money they are, they never zero either. There is always a chance that um, you'll be able to exercise profitably those securities. Uh, the values of all the securities are different as long as their rights and preferences are different. Uh, preferred stock has more rights and preferences than common, so they would uh, require more money to acquire those securities. At the same time, stock option is never as valuable as stock itself, and so it would be worth uh, less. Uh, economic and legal rights is something that affects uh, the relative value of all securities. So if uh, we give preferred stock um, a stronger economic rights, then that would in turn take away from the value of other uh, securities participating in the capital structure. Again, it's a fixed pie, it's a fixed amount of money here in that pie, and so the more value we give to one type of equity, the less money there is left for another type of the equity. And uh, finally, um, if um, even in the most uh, properly and um, most properly priced financing round, uh, the chances are that the values of individual securities uh, will move around. So even if the uh, you know, the company and the investor are both very happy with terms of financing. It's, um, it's likely in most cases that um, the values of other uh, pre-existing investors um, changed as a result of that financing. And so you, you do have to be pretty careful when you negotiate those rounds of financing that you don't just get cash and you don't just get those things that come with um, uh, next round of financing, but you also understand what kind of dilution or maybe accretion you uh, incur as a result of this type of financing. So let's uh, dive into the methodology. Option pricing method. Uh, just from the title of it, uh, you realize uh, that there is some kind of option pricing theory involved in this analysis. And so if you look at the very traditional 
a publicly traded call option, let's say an option, a call option on IBM stock. Um, you um, can buy that call option on the open market just today, call your broker and buy it. Um, uh, the, this call option gives you a right, so essentially you're buying a contract, you're buying a right uh, to um, buy um, a share of uh, underlying stock, let's say a share of IBM, for $100 anytime between now and nine months from now. And so the, the term is limited and the strike price is predetermined. So that's a stock option. Uh, the payout of this type of contract is uh, very obvious. It's if uh, the IBM stock ends up less than $100, less than its contract strike price, then you get nothing. If uh, it ends up with more than that, um, uh, then th this is your profit. All the delta goes uh, to your profit. Um, the payout is obvious. But what's a lot less obvious, and it requires pretty hard math to come to, is the value of this payout. In other words, depending on the current stock price, depending on how much time you're given to exercise your right, the, the value of this option will be different. And so in Black and Schultz formula is one of the um, most common methods to uh, value the, uh, this particular contract. On the other hand, let's look at our situation with our company there. Um, let's say we're common uh, stockholders, right? And um, uh, the company also was financed with some of the preferred stock, and that preferred stock has this so-called liquidation preference. In other words, if the company is sold for anything less than liquidation preference, all of the proceeds go to preferred shareholders. Anything above that liquidation preference goes to common shareholders. We assume here that um, those preferred shares uh, don't have conversion rights or participation rights, and which in itself is pretty rare. Um, but um, this would be the payout that common stock is facing um, given that capital structure. And so you can see that the payout is very similar. You get nothing. Uh, when the company is less than liquidation preference and value and you get um, the amount of money that's, um, you know, that remains after liquidation preference is paid off um, if the company value is above liquidation preference. So the payout is very similar and so the question becomes can we use the Black and Schultz formula to value common stock the way we value stock option here. And so it, it's important distinction here because this stock option here is a derivative uh, of a stock with a common stock as an underlying. Here we're valuing common stock itself with equity value, overall equity of the company being an underlying driver. So um, it, um, uh, it, it, it's possible, it, it's possible as long as you make a certain math uh, assumptions about the dynamic or statistical distribution of values on, of the underlying security. And so uh, it's really uh, what you're looking for here is for a statistical distribution of values of underlying securities to follow log normal distribution. Um, it's not always the case, and that's where some of the criticism of uh, option pricing methodology comes in. But in many cases, especially if the company uh, has a sort of a good um, operating history and a relatively established financial um, position, uh, you can make that assumption. So, um, again, the uh, types of inputs that go in the Black and Scholes formula are very similar, uh, although they're slightly different. Um, in, uh, in the case of the stock option, you use the stock price. <coughs> in, the case of, um, uh, in, in the case of this option pricing methodology, you use the current equity value as the, um, as the input um, in place of the stock price. 
uh, strike price uh, on the left here it's the contract strike price on the right here it's the liquidation preference price and then the time to liquidity and stock volatility those things could uh, also be used to um, make those calculations in both cases so that's really what um, drives this option pricing methodology we look at each equity class and as um, um, as an option. So you, if you hold this certain class of equity, you're really holding an option to participate in different types of payouts in the future. And uh, because there's uh, payouts could be different depending on the value of the company and depending on what rights and preference other equity holders would exercise, uh, your payout could be different and so uh, essentially we're using this option pricing methodology, we're using Black and Scholes formula or you can use other methods to value this um, uh, those potential payout scenarios. So ag again, uh, to go quickly here, uh, you'll see that um, on the value continuum um, you have two scenarios um, from the standpoint of either shareholder here, you have uh, one scenario that the company is sold for values that's less than liquidation preference, and the second scenario is that the company is sold for a value that's above liquidation preference. The values of each scenario together should add up to the total equity value, right, the $26 million. But how do you separate the $26 million? How much will you give um, out of this $26 million? How much will you give to this scenario uh, to the right relative to the scenario to the left. And so, as we said before, because the um, scenario to the right is when the common shareholders get all their profits and proceeds, then uh, we can use Black and Schultz formula to value that scenario to the right. And so, uh, that's um, what we get as a result of that mathematical calculation then uh, because uh, the scenario to the left is everything else then what we can do we can take equity value we can subtract the value of Black and Scholes formula and so that residual is something that we can attribute to the value of the scenario to the left in other words to the value that could be claimed by preferred shareholders and so from there, in, in order for us to get to the value of individual security, what we can do, we can take, in case of common stock, we'll take the value of Black and Scholes formula divided by number of shares, and so that's how we end up with the value of um, individual uh, share of common stock. You can do the same thing for preferred stock and take equity minus Black and Scholes formula, divided by number of preferred shares and that will be the value of the preferred share. The value of the preferred share would not be the value of the liquidation preference. Um, we make that assumption only at the time of financing, but it really if the financing took place a while ago, then uh, their liquidation preference becomes less and less um, relevant to the actual fair value of that individual share. You can see also that the uh, we considering a very simplistic capital structure here, and so if we have many different classes of preferred and common stock and um, stock options and warrants, then um, the continuum of value would have to be separated on many different payout scenarios. And this uh, here liquidation preference we can um, you know refer to that point as a break point where the type of um, you know, the mix of shareholders that participate in those particular scenarios change. So that would be a break point. And uh, so this analysis could get pretty complex. We'll get to those next steps in our second installation of uh, this presentation. Uh, so um, we'll look forward to seeing you there.